Welcome to The Cap, where we are here to speak with college reps and other professionals in the field of college admissions to help answer all your questions and guide you through every step of the process. So if you're serious about college admissions, you've come to the right place. Are you ready? Let's talk about it. And now, here's your host, Dr. John Durante. Welcome to The Cap, the College Admissions Process Podcast. I am your host, John Durante, and I am here to introduce you to college admissions representatives and other professionals in the field of college admissions. Our purpose is to serve you, the students and parents, so that you may gain insight straight from the people who ultimately make the decisions. Regardless of whether you apply to a particular school being highlighted in a given episode, you should listen to all of them, as each guest will give you tremendous insight and advice on every aspect of the college admissions process, prompting you to come up with your own follow-up questions for when you visit campus or meet with a college admissions representative yourself. Don't forget to visit our website, www.collegeadmissionstalk.com, or the show notes of each episode to access the alphabetical list of all the colleges available with the related audio link to the right of each school. The alphabetical list provides you with on-demand access to all of the episodes so that you may listen whenever you wish. And if you want to receive links to episodes before they are released on the podcast, along with other related resources, please fill out the email opt-in form also available on our website and in the show notes of each episode. Lastly, please email me with any questions or comments at collegeadmissionstalk at gmail.com. So are you ready? Let's talk about it. Welcome to The Cap, the College Admissions Process Podcast. I am your host, John Durante, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you today Hugh Doyle, who's the Director of Undergraduate Admissions at the University of Scranton. I had the great honor and pleasure of meeting Hugh down in Baltimore for the National Association for College Admissions Counseling. That's the NACAC conference that we were at down in Baltimore. Hugh, it was great meeting you there. It's great having you here today. How are you? Yeah, very good. Thanks, John. Yeah, it's great to be here. I uh, appreciate uh, you, you inviting me on. It was a pleasure meeting you as well and excited to talk a little Scranton today. Well, we appreciate you being here today. Looking forward to learning more about you and, of course, the awesome University of Scranton. So, Hugh, can you provide us with an overview of what the University of Scranton offers its students in terms of academic opportunities and what sets it apart from other colleges and universities? Yeah, great question. So uh, the University of Scranton is a Catholic Jesuit university located in northeastern Pennsylvania. Uh, we are sitting on about a 60-acre campus, two blocks from downtown Scranton. Uh, Scranton's a mid-sized city. We're about 70,000 people, but we're quite spread out. What that does is it gives our students a really great mixed kind of environment at, at the university. And what I mean by that is if I just dropped you um, on campus, right, you would feel like you would be having a pretty typical like suburban college town, you know, college campus feel um, at Scranton. Uh, but in reality, you're, you're two blocks from downtown Scranton. You're a mile from Interstate 81. Um, and getting in and out of the area is quite easy for our prospective students, our current students and all of that. Uh, but they're blocks from their favorite pizza shop and their their restaurants and places <laughs> to hang out downtown. Uh, so it, it's a nice mix. Um, academically, as a Jesuit institution, you know we are committed to, to excellence in academics at Scranton. We have nearly 70 different undergraduate majors, uh, over 30 graduate programs at the university as well. And many of them students are able to come you know, directly into. We do like direct um, admit options for a lot of those grad programs. Uh, many in our business school, our Kenya School of Management, uh, which houses all of our undergraduate and graduate business programs. There's also a handful in the College of Arts and Sciences, which houses, you know, your your hard sciences, your STEM programs. Um, but you know, for us, theology, philosophy, the humanities are, as well are very alive and well at the University of Scranton. And we do have our Prince College of Professional Studies too, uh, which houses programs that students can think of as like direct professional roots, um, mostly in the health sciences, uh, counseling and human services, nursing, occupational therapy, physical therapy, uh, things of that nature. Uh, so it, it, a lot of different academic options at the university, a lot of opportunities for students to mix and match. 
Uh, I can't tell you how many students I know with double majors in philosophy and biochemistry, you know, so uh, there's a there's a lot of opportunities to create uh, your own experience academically at the University of Scranton, uh, while having phenomenal access to faculty and facilities. Uh, we boast some pretty impressive class sizes at Scranton, uh, in, in my opinion. So for context there, we're just under 4,000 undergraduate students at the university with an average class size of 20, and classes typically cap at that 35 mark. Uh, so you really get to know your professors at Scranton, and they become a pretty uh, integral part of your academic experience and your personal growth and your future professional connections and, and everything in between. Um, so that's a nice touch, I think, for students to be able to, you know, be in an environment where they're not necessarily transitioning um, in, in a huge way out of what they may have experienced in high school. You know, they're, they're physically learning in, in a similar environment. You know, most students are experiencing that 30, 35 number in their high school classes and are able to continue to do that at, at Scranton, um, which, which is, I think is great. Um, faculty offices and spaces, you know, labs and research facilities and stuff of that nature right on our main campus. You know, we're, we're not hiding things two, three miles away from, from our main campus. Everything is, is right there. Um, I keep using the word main campus. We've just got campus, you know, we're just, <laughs> we're, we're just there on that 60 acres. And it, uh, again, it gives students access to everything from those faculty and staff to academic spaces, but also their health services, the counseling center and, and everything in between. So. Well, we appreciate that overview. You talked about the many opportunities to create your own experience at the University of Scranton. I love your low class sizes of around 20. And the fact that you are a Jesuit school whose mission is to look at the individual mm -hmm. and give attention to each and every one of your students and being mindful of respect and uniqueness of each of your community members, which is why your retention rate is somewhere around 90%, which is really high. The national average is at about 70%. So it sounds like you have something for everyone, both on your campus and beyond. You have about 70 undergraduate majors, 30 graduate programs, and most are direct admit, which is another great point that you made. So another thing, Hugh, that students and parents want to know about is student life on and off your campus. So what can you tell us about the student life experience at the University of Scranton and what kinds of extracurricular activities and organizations are available to your students? Yeah, and um, it's a great question and super important, right? When, when students feel, well, when, when students go through that college search and are looking into institutions, you know, the academics are certainly hugely important, but at the end of the day, you're living in that space. That's what you're going to call home for the next four years. And um, you want to make sure that that opportunities socially and extracurricularly line up with your interests. So that's something, you know, we certainly take to heart at the University of Scranton. And you kind of brought that up there with the individuality of each of our students and, and how we know that that's critical uh, to our mission um, and to really that college experience of, of being exposed to others that are different from yourself. And then none of us are the same. Um, and nobody has the same exact interests. And I feel like our campus does a very nice job of giving students those opportunities to explore uh, new things for them. Uh, <laughs> in, in some ways, our hundred uh, different clubs and organizations on campus. Uh, so that, that hundred number does include like club sports and intramural sports. Um, as well as just our general clubs and organizations, everything from academic affiliated groups on campus uh, to, you know, activity oriented things like the Mountain Sports Club or Ultimate Frisbee. Um, we also have, you know, things that are a little bit more cause driven, uh, like Catholic Relief Services, um, different organizations rooted to our Center for Service and Social Justice on campus. You know, maybe it's students involved with the, the Catholic side of the university a bit more. Um, but certainly that, those are just, you know, options for, for students. Um, no, no, no membership in any groups like that is, is required. Um, and, you know, beyond, beyond those opportunities, I mentioned previously how I think our location is special for our, for our size, right? I think the fact that you're two blocks 
from things to do downtown, you know, local shopping, restaurants, entertainment venues, escape rooms, you know, movie theaters, <laughs> things of that nature. You know, you're, you're walking to these places, you know, it's a 10, 15 minute walk. Uh, there is a loop, a bus loop uh, that is run by the, the county, the coal transportation system, and your student ID is a free bus pass. So if stuff is outside of that walking zone, you, know, you can get get on the bus and head to those different locations. Um, so Scranton is quite walkable. Um, most of our students at the University of Scranton, um, well, we're we're ninety percent residential students of our first year class. So that kind of frames where I want to go next, right? So what that does is creates this environment where, where the student life is very active. You know, we're not a commuter school. Um, our locals and our out of the area, out of the state students are almost equally involved on campus, right? I mean, they they're all very engaged. And that has a lot to do with the clubs and organizations I just spoke about briefly, but, you know, also has to do with the the community, right? And then when students are hitting those upperclassmen years, those junior and senior years, um, they are moving off campus, but they're moving across the street. <laughs> you know, they're not, they're not going that far. And that creates another little community right there off campus, uh, which again is across the street. So it, it's really helpful in keeping that University of Scranton community, which is so important to us, um, really active. Uh, the University of Scranton Programming Board is responsible for most of our large-scale events on campus, uh, and students living off campus, on campus, commuting are all welcome to attend those different events. So they really drive the bus there, uh, typically have events every Thursday, Friday, and Saturday night um, available, you know, formally for students too. Well, I appreciate the overview, 100 clubs and organizations, and I really appreciate how you talked about 90% residential students, which means that you have a very active student life, as you mentioned, and most importantly, the fact that you said it's not a commuter school, which is a good question for students and parents to ask when you visit a college, is it a commuter school? In other words, do students stay on campus or do they all leave and go home on the weekend? So it's great that you mentioned that. So let's dig a little bit into the application process itself. Hugh, what is your approach to the admissions process, particularly in terms of the criteria and factors considered when reviewing your applications? Yeah, great question. So uh, first of all, Scranton tries to make things uh, pretty straightforward for prospective students interested in applying. So we are on the Common App. We, we don't have an application fee, so it's quite easy to, to apply to Scranton. Um, and we do not use any of the supplemental uh, essays or supplemental uh, required supplemental materials. So uh, it is, again, just about as straightforward uh, as it can get to apply to Scranton. Uh, we do need, of course, the official high school transcript and uh, the counselor recommendation, you know, so all those pieces built into the Common App, but nothing above and beyond per se there. So um, we, we do try and, you know, help students out in any way we can. You know, we're pretty uh, open line of communication in terms of questions and, and things like that. Uh, for instance, the Common App's a great tool. Uh, I think that some ways in student, uh, for certain students, the ways they like to express themselves might not fit into those little boxes in the Common App, right? The activities section and, and the, the extracurriculars and the sports and all of that. So, you know, by all means, you know, fill it out. Um, but if, if you have additional materials you want to send us, like a resume or a little bit of a CV or something, you know, that's totally fine too. Um, we'll happily attach that to the application. In terms of the review process, you know, we do then look at all those pieces that, that we've asked for. We'd love to see students who have a well-rounded involvement in their community or life outside the classroom. But, uh, you know, at the University of Scranton, we have students joining us from uh, lots of different backgrounds, lots of different walks of, of life. Uh, and we know that means something different for everybody, right? So doesn't mean you have to be in four or five clubs in high school and a tri-sport athlete. Uh, maybe you work and help your family. Uh, maybe you volunteer in the local community when you can. And, and um, you know, otherwise you're, you're pretty busy and, and that's okay too. You know, we're, we're understanding you know, that, that Jesuit mindset of every individual being unique and having their own story and, and, and being their own piece to, to this greater puzzle is really shown in the way that Scranton reviews applicants. You know, we, um, we're not trying to be a, a highly selective institution at the University of Scranton. We, we want students to be successful at Scranton. We want to set them up um, to do well if they decide to join us. And, and that's really what's happening 
during our application review process. Um, now, on, on that note, you know, there's certainly some some things that that we look for there in terms of, you know, average GPA and, and profile and things like that. Uh, so last year, our average um, enrolled student was right around a 359 um, and an SAT, ACT equivalent of about a, a 1230. Um, but again, that's the average enrolled student. Um, our middle 50% profile uh, for an applicant, um, the, the GPA range is a about a 336 to a 39, an 88 to 98, SAT of 1150 to 1310, or ACT of 25 to 31. Um, and again, middle 50% profiles, not hard cutoffs by any stretch of the imagination, but that's you know what, what a typical applicant is looking like at Scranton. We are completely test optional across the board. Uh, we have been test optional for about 20 plus years at this point. Uh, there used to be some restrictions to that uh, regarding some of our more competitive programs, uh, which are occupational therapy, physical therapy, nursing. And I'll be honest, nursing um, is truly the, the most competitive undergraduate major at the university. Uh, while OT and PT you know, can be competitive as well, they are capped majors. Um, typically students within our profiles are strong um, applicants that have a two OT and PT that have some you know really good footing um, if they're falling within that middle fifty percent profile. Now that's not a guaranteed admit by any stretch, you know, but th th some good footing to be on. Uh, for nursing students, we do typically find them at the higher end of that profile. Um, you know, again, that, that doesn't mean you need a fifteen hundred and a four zero. Um, that's <laughs> not you know not not the case, but certainly at the higher end of that admitted student profile. I want to welcome back Sean Patel, who's the CEO and founder of Prep Expert. Sean, thank you so much for being here. How are you? Doing well. Thanks for having me, John. Just wanted to do a quick shout out for an amazing deal that we have for college admissions process podcast listeners. We're offering 30% off all Prep Expert SAT and ACT courses in tutoring. It's live online. We've got the best score improvement guarantees in the industry. You'll get taught by 99th percentile instructors. And you can save 30% off when you go to the show notes of the College Admissions Process Podcast. Grab your discount code for 30% off and click the link in the show notes. Thank you, Sean. So great to have you again. And to everyone out there, please note that if you make a purchase through any of our affiliate links, the podcast gets a commission. But rest assured that we would only promote products that we believe in and feel would benefit our listeners. Thank you all and best wishes. Well, we appreciate that overview. Number one, you set your students up for success, which is really important because you recognize that everyone is unique and has their own story. So students, make sure you're telling that story. Make sure that you're including every aspect of who you are as a person in the overall application. Hugh mentioned the activity sheet. If you hold a job, perhaps you take care of a relative, make sure that you indicate that. That is very important for them to know in terms of what you do outside of the classroom. You're on the Common App, no application fee, which is fantastic no supplemental essay. So everything is pretty much straightforward in terms of your overall application itself. So Hugh, what are the different ways that a student may apply to the University of Scranton? And is there a benefit to applying one way over the other? Yeah, great question. So um, at this time, we have early action um, and regular decision. So early action, uh, I know it's talked about quite, quite a bit. I'm sure a lot of your, your guests uh, lay this out. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> early action important is, is non-binding form of early application. Uh, our early action deadline for uh, submission is November 15th. Now we understand real life is happening all around us. So that November 15th deadline to us genuinely just means having the Common App submitted by November 15th. Uh, you have a transcript holding you up or, a, or, you know, a recommendation or something like that, please just hit the button um, on the common app. We're going to 
probably nudge you and follow up with you <laughs> for that other stuff, but that that's not going to impact that early action status of, of your application. Um, and then we do have regular decision as well. Uh, and regular decision, our deadline, preferred deadline is, is March 1st. Uh, but again, pretty, pretty flexible people at Scranton, uh, willing to work with students um, throughout the spring if they're still searching. Um, I'm going to pop back to early action there, though, and, and touch on really critical for those nursing applicants, um, OT applicants, PT applicants, um, really those programs just get more competitive as time goes on. So being among that first pool um, of students applying early action can be quite critical um, for you uh, to, to set yourself up for success there. You know, I often talk to students for the first time in, in, a, in a lot of cases, you know, fall their senior year, open house or, or, a, or a visit to campus that they're making over the summer or myself being out on the road in the fall and you know, not to scare anybody, but senior year, your GPA is pretty locked up, right? I mean, you're, there, you're, you're not doing much, much moving at that point. You know, the one thing you can do for, for us at that point is to submit an early action application. You know, there, you, you're not going to move heaven and earth uh, your senior year. Keep working hard. Keep doing what you're doing. But but apply early action um, if you're interested in those programs for sure. So early action candidates will hear back from us with their initial decision by December 15th. Um, we do not initially send any deny decisions to an early action applicant. We typically would give them an opportunity to interview um, they, and we would defer that application to regular decision. Um, uh, so that's a nice protection there too. Well, I appreciate that. So let me review a couple of things. First of all, there's two ways of applying early action where your deadline is November 15th, but you mentioned you're a little flexible with that, which is great. Usually in the early action round, you're going to get a decision by December 15th if you're not deferred, which I'll come back to. Regular decision, the deadline is March 1st, and I appreciate again that you mentioned the flexibility there if you're waiting on uh, a, a college recommendation or something like that. You keep on mentioning the competitive nature of the nursing program. So in addition to applying early, right, which is a really good way to show that you might be interested in a particular school, do you have any other pieces of advice for a student applying for the nursing program specifically? I know how competitive those programs are, and there's a lot of students that are interested. So any other thoughts on that, Hugh? Yeah, uh, I think, you know, there's a couple different things there. First of all, there are eight awesome admissions counselors that report directly to me in, in the admissions office at the University of Scranton. And, and I still manage a territory myself, as does uh, my boss, our associate vice president for um, admissions, uh, Joe Roback. And we're all in this job because we love people and we love interacting with students. And if, if you're interested in nursing, I, I would recommend interacting with us at a certain level, right? Let us know who you are. Let us know you're interested um, a visit is awesome. A, a visit to campus is great for, for both of us. Um, one, you'll fall in love with campus and that's a promise. Um, <laughs> and, you know, we'll see that, that you're, you know, a serious applicant. Um, and also, you know, keeping in touch with us is really helpful uh, through that process so we can have that open, open chain of communication. Um, otherwise, you know, again, some things it's hard to change by senior year, but certainly for nursing students, keep an eye on those math and science grades and, you know, keep um, keep exposing yourself to experiences that are going to make you the most competitive applicant you can be. Well, that's great insight. And I appreciate you saying that if you're serious students, let it be known. Reach out to your admissions representative. Obviously, keep working hard academically through senior year and beyond. And again, don't be bashful to reach out. Now, you also mentioned that students that apply early action, and this could be for any major, right? Sometimes they're deferred. And yes, when a sir. student is deferred, automatically they think it's a rejection. And it's not a rejection, right, Hugh? We know mm -hmm. that it's a no for now, but maybe later. And so what advice would you give to a student who's serious about coming to the University of Scranton? They apply early action, they're deferred into the regular decision round. Anything that they can do to show that they're serious, in addition to sending out a continued interest letter, perhaps, yeah. what else can they do in this process? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, 
tell us your story. You know, <laughs> um, there, there's probably a reason you're, you're deferred. Um, and the reason is in, in our eyes to, to make sure um, you would be successful at Scranton, which I've already touched on, right? So, but how do you do that? And, and quite frankly, it, it's just having that conversation with us. It's simply um, keeping us in the loop, right? What What's going on? Where, why was there that that rocky sophomore year? Or, you know what What are some of those um, What are some of those stories that help us understand? You know the challenges you faced, um, how you interacted with them at the time. And how you're going to take that next step forward, or maybe how you have taken that next step, and how you're sure that it's working for you, and you know that's going to be something you can continue on to, uh, or continue on with, you know, into college. Now, that's certainly true across the board, John. Right? Like any any major um, that that statement could be true for coming into Scranton. And, you know, especially students in that nursing program who might get deferred, really um, you know, highly encourage you to have a conversation with us because you, you're, you're not getting deferred. You're not getting deferred because you're a weak student. Um, if, if you're a nursing student at, uh, applicant at the University of Scranton and, and you're getting a deferred decision, that means you're a strong student. <laughs> and we're interested in, in hearing from you and having a conversation. And we are genuinely hoping at that point to be able to offer you a seat in the future. Um, but we just don't always know if it's possible. And, and that's typically uh, when and why the deferred decision is used for prospective nurses. Well, we appreciate that. And I'm glad I asked about the deferral process. And of course, the transcript is a very important piece of the overall application as it helps you determine whether or not you believe a student can handle the rigors of the courses on your campus. So Hugh, what are you looking for when reviewing a student's transcript and do you use the GPA indicated on it, or do you recalculate it using your own metrics? Yeah, great, great question. And certainly a thought on everyone's mind. I know that for sure. Um, the, the model of, you know, recruitment we use at Scranton has been the same for, for quite a while in terms of our, our territory management and, and how our admissions counselors are going out and interacting with our with our friends on the high school side um, and, you know, recruiting students. And, and what that means for us is we have a pretty intimate knowledge of literally every high school that we visit um, in terms <laughs> of their, their processes. So, you know, the short answer here is we do not recalculate GPAs and we use um, the information we're receiving on the transcript. The, you know, the, the caveat is we have notes, you know, the, re, re, regarding how, how things work at certain high schools to help us guide that a little bit more specifically. What we very openly do and openly communicate um, is ultimately what we're trying to do at Scranton is, is get your GPA to a 4.0 scale. Um, so we, we are trying to compare your, your GPA um, to your peer applicants um, in, in that way. So we're trying to get everything on a 4.0 scale. Now, that doesn't mean we are not looking at weighted GPAs. Like if your high school is telling us that they're on a 4.0 scale, but you have a weighted GPA and, and you have a 4.2, that, that's great. We're just trying to, to understand that first piece of information, right? The, the initial scale of the GPA being on the four, four point scale. Um, so that, that's really where, um, you know, we do a little bit of work and have a little bit of understanding with how individual high schools ac across our recruitment territories operate. Um, but that would be the, the extent of our recalculations um, at the university. Well, I appreciate you talking about how you're well aware of what the different high schools that you serve have to offer. And for students and parents who might be interested, it's always helpful to look at your high school's school profile. This is what the admissions representatives see. That gives them insight in terms of what your high school has to offer. Many times there's grade distributions and other information. So if you're not familiar with it, usually it's on your high school's website or reach out and get a copy of it because it's definitely something interesting to see so that you know what the admissions representatives are seeing about your high school on the other end. So Hugh, can you share the percentage of students that apply from out of state and does the application process differ based on in-state or out-of-state status? That's a great question. So at the University of Scranton, I'll, I'll first hit off that, you know, there is no review differences um, in-state 
versus out of state. Um, and at the university, we are very proud of our local students. We're very <laughs> proud of our Pennsylvania state students, but gosh, do we have a lot of out of state students at Scranton. So uh, we're about 67% out of state in terms of applicants. So um, 33% of our applicants um, are, are in state um, with, with a great majority being uh, from the Eastern half of Pennsylvania. Well, that's good to know. 67% out of state, around 33% in state. And of course, you cost of college is a major consideration for so many families. Mm -hmm. What financial aid or scholarship opportunities do you offer prospective students? Yeah, so we try and make that process as easy as possible, too. Uh, we use your application simply your application and, and, and the merit you are reporting in terms of uh, your merit achievements, in terms of your GPA and test scores, if you have submitted them uh, to calculate and to, to work with our scholarship committees to, to come up you know, with your merit scholarship offer. And that would be right on your acceptance letter, right? So there's no additional information needed at that stage. Uh, as a private institution, uh, we are well aware um, of the the hindrances that the cost of college you know can be for families, and we are working diligently every day uh, to make sure that a Scranton education is affordable as it as it can be uh, for our prospective students, and ultimately you know of course the students that are joining us on campus. Uh, what what I'm getting at there is we certainly do have other opportunities beyond just merit scholarship uh, for aid for families. So we do offer institutional aid, um, institutional gift aid uh, through our financial aid office. So we do need the FAFSA submitted for that. And we always do a lot to help students understand these processes. Uh, we have virtual financial aid nights at the University of Scranton, uh, webinars uh, to help students really get a grasp of what they need to do. Um, we had over 600 registered families for our financial aid uh, 101 webinar in the beginning of uh, December, which really just showed there is a need out there um, and, and students need this information. And don't don't be mistaken, if you're a student interested in Scranton, uh, you, you, you're going to have access to a lot of resources from us, you know, to, to help you navigate that aid process. Um, of course, financial aid will help you navigate those state and federal aid programs and processes as well. Uh, but we do offer that merit gift aid as well as need-based uh, grants gift aid at Scranton too. Well, we appreciate that overview, specifically the webinars that you talked about and how you're very mindful of providing whatever aid you can to each of your students. So, you know, Hugh, I always put the Office of Undergraduate Admissions in the show notes. If there's any other information you want me to include related to financial aid or anything else, perhaps your webinars, perhaps your net price calculator, just send it to me. And of course, I'll make the links available to the students and the parents in the show notes. So what is the average profile of the current freshman class in terms of GPA and any other related data that you collect, such as SAT or ACT scores? And I know that you test optional and you've been test optional, mm -hmm. but if a student falls lower than your mid-50, what are some of the things that they can do to enhance their overall application? Yeah, absolutely. So happy to review the, the middle 50% profile, the, the current class. So uh, this was the, the first year, fall 2023 uh, student um, was on average a, a 3.59 on a 4.0 scale with a 12.37 technically uh, SAT score, although I don't think you can actually get a 12.37 on the SAT, um, <laughs> as well as a 28 ACT. So again, that's like the, that's dead center. Um, that That's the true um, av average student, enrolled student for the fall. You know, for students that are falling below that range, I mean, they're there is a lot um, going on on our end, you know, in terms of reviewing of your application and trying to get an intimate understanding of your abilities. And, you know, you're still in a very nice place in terms of re your review at, at Scranton there. The, that 359, again, is not a, is not a minimum. Um, the students really uh, achieving near that mark are, are in a comfortable position uh, for, for a lot of our academic programs, you know, at Scranton, you know, what students can do and, and what I, 
I think is an important part um, of the puzzle for, for everybody is just having conversations with us and, and, and reaching out. I, I know I've probably said that two or three times at this point, but it helps everybody in, in such a great way. Um, helps you be more aware of your own college search process and, and have a better understanding of, of what's going on in front of you and, and what to expect, how to adapt, and, and really how to understand the information that, that's coming at you at what feels like a million miles an hour um, when, when you're a senior in, in high school. And, you know, if, if you are a first generation student, um, there's certainly, you know, things that, you know, your, your, your parents or guardians are going to be really trying to help you with and, and, but they're trying to understand it themselves. And, and we're well aware of that and really happy to, to bridge whatever gaps we can bridge. And a lot of it comes, comes in pretty early, right? A lot of those questions are going to come up before you even get an acceptance decision from, from Scranton or, uh, or whatever decision you may get. And, and it's during your search, right? It, it's during that, where am I going to apply stage of, uh, uh, of the process. And so we really want to make clear that, you know, if, if you're not hitting these middle 50% averages or this, this absolute average I, I gave for our fall uh, 23 class, you know, that that's okay. And, um, to speak a little bit broadly, it's okay in a lot of places and from a lot of schools, and, and none of us want you to be confused by that. So certainly chat with us and, and ask questions. But, you know, visiting campus, I think, is another huge piece of the puzzle um, for uh, a student who's a little less confident in, in who they are on, on paper. You know, chat with an admissions counselor, set up a meeting, um, and, and check out the school for yourself and, and let that institution know, hopefully us at Scranton, let us know, um, <laughs> that, that, you know, you're somebody who's seriously interested in, in the university, um, and talk to us about how, how you would fit, um, a, a, as the next unique piece of the puzzle at Scranton. So what's up podcast friends. I'm happy to share that we've teamed up with Dormco to make your dorm decorating a lot easier. Why Dormco? They offer quality and durability, affordability, and a wide selection for bedding to storage solutions and everything in between for your dorm room. So if you or anyone you know is looking to decorate your dorm, see the affiliate partnership link in the show notes for Dormco, your one stop for stylish, affordable, and quality dorm essentials. Please note that if you make a purchase through any of our affiliate links, the podcast gets a commission. But rest assured that we would only promote products that we believe in and feel would benefit our listeners. Thank you all and best wishes. Well, we appreciate that. You emphasize reaching out. Number one, it helps you, the student, be more aware about the University of Scranton and whether or not it is, in fact, the right fit for you. But it also helps the admissions representatives understand the fact that you are very much interested in attending the University of Scranton. I love how you talked about the mid 50%. I'm going to just review it. It's a 3.59 on a 4.0 scale. Your SAT is that famous 1237 <laughs> ACT at 28. I just want to point out that that's the mid 50%, which means that 25% of the students scored higher, 25% scored lower. And the fact that those test scores, especially since you're test optional, they're skewed in terms of the fact that only students that frankly did well submitted. So if you see a score students, a test score, and you feel that you're going to be a little below it, or you are in fact a little below it, that does not necessarily mean that you're not going to be accepted. So don't be afraid of those numbers. And in addition to reaching out, which you emphasize, Hugh, what are some of the things that students do to demonstrate their interest? And does it come into play at any point in your overall application review process? Yeah, great question. So we are very good at um, understanding who you have been through your your search process in, in regards to Scranton, right? So um, when a college rep visits your high school or you meet them at a college fair and they're bothering you to fill out a piece of paper or a, <laughs> an e-form or whatever it may be, um, and you say, oh, you know, I get your email already or I, I, I get this or, you know, I, I've filled one of these out before. That's all well and good. And, and that's fine if you don't want to fill it out again. I'm, I'm not pressuring you to do so, but I just want everybody to, to understand and know that that's just not information that we, we grab for fun, right? There's a lot of 
lot of conversations about um, a what information we truly do need, but you know, more importantly, making sure it's it's useful for you as the student, and and it's important for you to fill that out. And for instance, in terms of you know showing interest, you, you you're asking how can that student show interest beyond just reaching out? Well, you know, just doing those little things makes a difference um, because we can see all the different interactions you've had with us over over the years and i literally mean the years i mean there are students (laughs) that you know interact with us for the first time as a as a first year student in high school and and Hmm. see us once maybe twice a year for the next three and a half years before they make their their college decision and and we see that now am i saying if you didn't do that you're you're at some gross disadvantage no that that's not true And, and and you know it's not what it comes down it's not all that it comes down to but you know, if you're sitting at, at, with the admissions committee and, you know, you're me, if I was your rep out on, you know, Long Island when I, when I <laughs> first started, you know, and, and it was somebody I had met all these times and, and had all these conversations with, you know, just know that that admissions counselor is, is going to bat for you um, in those processes and, and they remember you. And yeah, I'm not, I'm not saying you have to send an email every week or something like that, <laughs> but, you know, doing those little things does add up. And, and schools and, and Scranton, you know, specifically, we, we see how many times you've you've interacted with us. And and I think, you know, in terms of demonstrated interest, that's a pretty sharp uptick. And, um, you know, that counselor, or the chances that that counselor is going to remember you when, when they're sitting down with the committee to to talk things out. So I, I think it's something important to remember. Well, we appreciate that. And it's one of the reasons why we have this podcast. We really want to pull the curtain back and look into the admissions office and gain insight into things just like that, right? If I saw you at my high school and later I see you at a college fair and I'm interested in the University of Scranton, take the time to say hello, fill out the card, you know, scan the QR code, whatever it is, students, just do it. And those interactions are very important. It's important for you to get to know the admissions counselor, but perhaps more important for them to get to know you because you never know if they have to advocate for you when decisions are being made in the admissions office. So again, we appreciate the insight and digging deeper with the overall application review. When reviewing applications from all these high schools from throughout the country, how do you take into account when one student school offers, let's say, 20 advanced placement courses while someone else's offers far less, let's say five? Yeah, it's a great point. And there are so many different high schools out there and so many different ideas of, and so many, you know, unfortunately, in some cases, a vast difference in resources that, that, are, that are available at some schools. And, you know, here at Scranton, we do just about everything in our power to make sure that does not put the student at a disadvantage, right? But we, we do our best to balance that in, in a sense of certainly want to reward the student who has taken three and four AP classes for, for every year they, they could have at their high school as well. So it's a fine balance, but we, we do have our, our methods to, to understand that, right? If you're a student at a high school with five, that only offers five APs, I just challenge you to to take, take the ones that you can take, you know, and, and, and I assure you that, that Scranton is going to consider that just the same as the student that challenged themselves and, and, and took a high proponent or similar proponent of, of AP classes at a school that offered, you know, maybe 20 plus, you know, APs are different for everybody too. You know, I, the high school I graduated from while I was there, I think we had four AP classes offered only and um, four or five and, and they were they were all math and science, and I was not a math and science guy myself. And you know, I was happy to know uh, in my in my search that the schools I was looking into, you know, weren't going to hold that against me. Now that was also a few years ago, um, so mm-hmm. I, I know there's a, a lot more even even now heat on on schools to be offering those APs, and and of course trickling down to students to take them, right? Um, but we really do look at it in the lens of each high school. And as, um, as you mentioned earlier, John, you know, our counselors are taking a look at that school report and getting an understanding of, of the options each and every one of these students um, had um, at that high school. And, and we're looking at it through those specific lenses. Well, we appreciate that. And can you explain what opportunities the University of Scranton offers students 
that may have had an IEP while in high school mm -hmm. in terms of helping to ensure that they continue to be successful once they're on your campus? Absolutely. So our Office of Student uh, Support and Success, um, OSSS, uh, at the <laughs> University of Scranton, uh, is really passionate ab about that very thing and making sure that students who you know had an IEP or something else going on uh, have the opportunities they need to continue to achieve at the high level that, that they have already shown they can, right? So, um, you know, basic resources certainly are available um, in terms of assisting the student make the transition, right? They're really um, quite forthcoming in terms of the information is all right on our website, the Office of Student Support and Success. It's all right out there. Um, and once a student chooses Scranton, um, they will begin to see those forms become available. So it's not something we hang on to like, oh, wait till you get your foot in the door first semester. Like, no, you know. <laughs> Really, the, this spring or the spring of your senior year, I should say, you'd have the opportunities to begin to dig into that that process. And, um, you know, they offer everything I hope that, that you need to, to transition successfully from whatever accommodations you were offered in high school um, and are needed to, to be successful. So, you know, there is, of course, the typical processes of perhaps it's a it's a revisit um, to ensure that that these accommodations are still relevant to the student. Um, but ultimately, the accommodations such as, you know, longer test time, uh, note taking, uh, or, you know, like, a, like a, no, a low distraction test environment are all certainly common ones I hear. Um, so I just thought I'd mention those and all certainly something that our um, office, you know, can handle. Well, that's great. And again, any links that you want me to share with the students and their parents just provide it to me and we'll put them in the show notes particularly to the center awesome. and what about students who are i'm sorry were you going to say something yeah can i if i could just add one Please. thing there um i also want to make it known that you know this the office of student support and success at scranton is housed in our largest academic building on campus, the Loyola Science Center, hmm. where all of our science courses, as well as our general education humanities courses are offered too. So these aren't hard places to get to. They aren't hard places to access. And for students that need them on a regular basis, they easily uh, within your routine uh, to, to get to and from um, and, and really you know, I think helps the student not feel as though they're, they're isolated uh, for, for needing these accommodations. Well, I appreciate you sharing the location and the accessibility, the ease in which a student can get to it because it's right there in the heart of your campus. So Hugh, what about students who intend to play sports in college? How does the process differ for them? And what advice would you share with them in terms of what they need to be aware of throughout their own recruitment process? Yeah, thanks uh, for that opportunity. We love our sports at Scranton. Uh, we are a, a, a Division three school. Go Royals. Go Royals, absolutely. So we're, we're Division three school at the University of Scranton. We compete in the Landmark Conference, uh, so some, some great competition up and down the East Coast, um, and Atlantic, North Atlantic. Uh, Washington, D.C. is our, <laughs> our, our southernmost stop, um, but phenomenal athletics programs at the University of Scranton. Uh, I'd, I'd have to check my math, but we're awfully close to 50 conference championships across all of our wow. uh, sports teams. So uh, really excited to continue to see that that trend. What I do have to say there is, you know, we have everything from, you know, baseball and softball, to, you know, your soccer, men's and women's soccer, lacrosse, basketball, track and field, swimming, they're all a little different, right? You're, you're talking different size teams, different needs. Um, and of course, that comes down to coaches having slightly different processes in place. So what I would recommend is heading to the athletics website, the University of Scranton Athletics website, filling out that interest form. Or if you're having a hard time finding it, or you just want to make sure the coach recognizes your name when that form comes through, you want to shoot them an email that's fine too. Their emails are all on the website as well. But those would be the first steps I would recommend. Um, and the reason I would recommend them, um, and especially early, is because a lot of our athletics teams have some great opportunities for students to get out there um, and show coaches they have some interest in competing at Scranton uh, through different ID camps that they could be invited to um, or things of that nature. And our coaches are passionate. They're, they're nose to the grindstone. They do a lot of traveling offseason um, to, to see all of you compete at the high school level. 
whether it's through your high school teams, travel teams, whatever it might be, uh, you know, let, letting the coaches know of your interest, where, where you are um, is, is an important piece of the puzzle. It could, um, could, could make a lot of differences. Well, we appreciate that, and good luck to all the student athletes out there. Hugh, this has been a phenomenal conversation. I think we covered a lot, but before I get to the last question, I have to ask, is there a question I didn't ask today or a topic that I didn't bring up that you'd like to talk to us about now? So I just want to add, you know, one thing there, and and I know early on I, I gave a little bit of an overview of the University of Scranton. Um, but the one thing I, I don't think I, I hit home as hard as, as it could be, uh, mostly is because you, you got to feel it for yourself. Uh, hmm. But the University of Scranton really is a special place. Um, it, it's a place um, where our, our late president, Father Scott Pilar, has always said that, you know, College is a place you trip and fall. The only difference is at the University of Scranton, by the time you look up, there'll be several hands outstretched to pick you back up again. And that just has resonated so heavily with me throughout my life. Um, I'm an alum, double alum of Scranton, as is my wife and my little brother's on campus now. And there's not another place in the world that I would trust uh, more to, to just let somebody find themselves and um, get a high class education to, to go on and, and make an impact in the, in the world. And that's just something we're really passionate about at the university. As the, the Jesuits say, go forth and set the world on fire. And um, hmm. that, that's what that's what we're all about. Well, that's fantastic. And obviously, the University of Scranton is very lucky to have you, as were we during this podcast episode. We really appreciate your time here today, Hugh. Unfortunately, it does lead us to that last question, which is, what are the top three pieces of advice you would give a student and their parents getting ready for the college admissions process? Yeah, absolutely. So th this was fun to think about. And I, <laughs> I have to say, um, Number one, vi visit schools, right? Uh, the, the internet's a great tool, but I just think there's, there's nothing that can replace, you know, physically feeling a campus. Um, and the other thing is schools get to kind of manicure that online presence a little bit, right? And, and when you get there in person, don't just go on the tour. Don't just talk to the admissions reps. Explore campus a little bit. I challenge every visitor at the University of Scranton to go find somebody that, um, you know, they didn't see in the admissions office and ask them a question, see how they feel. Um, I'm confident in their answer at Scranton, uh, but I think it's an important, important part of the process. You know, really, really get to know what you're looking at. Uh, the other thing is, and I've mentioned this, you know, don't be afraid to ask questions. We're, we're here to help and we ultimately want what's best for you. You know, we hope it's Scranton. We hope Scranton is the best thing for you uh, in your college experience, but we recognize that, um, it's a, it's a world of a lot of twists and turns out there and then navigating the college search process can be very difficult. So just take advantage of the resources that are out there um, and, and have conversations, ask questions. And, you know, 25% of students on our campus at the University of Scranton right now are first generation students. And I, I, I just say that because I, I find sometimes that students are or families are afraid to ask. But I just, you know, I don't want you to be and uh, I, I want you to, to use ev everything that you can get your hands on to help you navigate this process a little a little more cleanly um, for all of those those involved. The last piece of advice is um, let what you love motivate your college search process. Uh, don't get distracted by what others say you should do or what they say you should want. Um, everyone has their own path. You'll find yours as long as you let your heart kind of steer the ship, right? And um, it's a big decision, but you're going to do the right thing and you're going to make the right decision for you. And um, everybody that, that needs to support you in that, I think if that's your motivation, you know, ultimately will. Well, those are great pieces of advice. And this has been a terrific conversation. Hugh, I really can't thank you enough. I'm so happy as I know that this is going to help so many students and their parents as they navigate through the college admissions process. I do hope to have you again. Thank you so much for your time today. Thanks, John. I appreciate it. And uh, it was great to be here. It was our honor and pleasure. And to everyone out there, good luck with the college search. Take care, everyone, and best wishes.
Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Cap, the college admissions process podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please don't forget to tell a friend and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and wherever you listen to your podcasts. I am your host, John Durante, and I look forward to seeing you on the next episode of The Cap. Hey, podcast friends, are you or someone you know in need of some custom college gear? Prep Sportswear carries a wide variety of college fan gear and apparel, including T-shirts, sweatshirts, hoodies, hats, and so much more. So whether you're getting ready to go to the game, hanging out on campus, organizing a college bed decorating party, or you're simply looking to build upon your college gear, Prep Sportswear has you covered. Check out our Prep Sportswear affiliate partnership link in the show notes for all the details. Please note that if you make a purchase through any of our affiliate links, the podcast gets a commission, but rest assured that we would only promote products that we believe in and feel would benefit our listeners. Thank you all and best wishes.